Hello, viewers. Welcome to a series on building water systems. I am Kyungyan Ra at Purdue University. This brief presentation is designed to help you better understand flushing building water systems. I hope you enjoyed this video, and let me start with learning objectives. We'll specifically talk about why flushing is helpful in improving water quality. You'll also learn about three goals of flushing, differences between initial and repeated flushing, the importance of flushing with fresh water, and some challenges regarding flushing. Before we jump into main content, I want to acknowledge a number of people from different organizations. Thank you to all the collaborators. Here is a scientific report where you can read about the concerns with stagnant water in large buildings. And this is some of our awesome Purdue people going to building sampling. We have been working at residential to commercial building water systems for many years. Our website plumbingsafety.org has a lot more resources you can refer to. Now, let's talk about what flushing can do. When the water is not used in the building, or not used as much as before, the water just sits there and gets old. These images are from commercial buildings after the water set in pipes because of low water use. As you see, this water does not look great. Old water can have chemical and microbiological problems. These include harmful organisms like Legionella. We want to avoid harmful water because we can get exposed when faucets are turned on. Flushing is an easy way that can help reduce water problems. Flushing can be done periodically to keep water moving through a building. It may be done when building is opened and several times after a long-term building closing. In the next slide, I will show you what is happening during flushing. This image shows you what water is like under normal conditions. In this figure, the oval shapes represent bacteria, and it can be found in the water itself or on the wall of the water pipe too. The weird spiky shaped symbols represent corrosion products. These can be iron, lead, copper, and other contaminants that can also affect bacteria growth or be harmful themselves. When the water sits in the pipe, it gets old. During this time, more bacteria and harmful organisms move into the water and grow. Heavy metals like lead and copper also accumulate in the water. So, by flushing, we can remove this old water so no one drinks or uses it. Flushing can remove some bacteria along the walls and sediments, but not all materials are possibly removed. The third goal of flushing is to bring fresh water into pipes. This fresh water should have lower amounts of bacteria, lower amounts of food for bacteria, and a disinfectant chemical. Now you have a better idea of how flushing could help improving building water quality. In previous slides, I mentioned you could do repeated flushing. Repeated flushing can be used when buildings have low occupancy or not occupied. If water gets old, the water may become unsafe. Also, as you just saw in the animation, one-time flushing may not remove everything in pipes, especially when the building is closed for a longer time and there are more contaminants in the pipe. So, we recommend repeated flushing to change water use in the building. However, if the water coming into the building is not fresh, the benefit of flushing is reduced. Or worse, the building water system could become contaminated. Using fresh water to flush a building water system is really important. Water quality inside the building is the responsibility of the building owner to monitor. For large public water systems, water utilities only monitor their monitoring stations and where their buried water piping network stops. So, it is important that building owners check for themselves that the water coming in for flushing is actually fresh. Now, the next question is, how do we know if the water entering the building is fresh? After the water is disinfected, fresh water should have some level of chemical disinfectant, normally chlorine. The water should also have low bacteria levels. To find out for yourself if the water is fresh, we recommend a few water tests before and while you are flushing. Consider testing for the chemical disinfectant using an inexpensive digital device. 
this might be chlorine, and building owners should ask what chemical is in their water. Testing for water temperature is also a good idea. By testing for these simple tests, building owners can determine if the water entering the building is fresh and old water has been flushed out of the building. For your reference, the World Health Organization recommends that at least 0.2 mg per liter of chlorine be present in drinking water. Note that it could take longer time to get certain disinfectant residual level or temperature in larger buildings, or if your building is in the middle of many other buildings with low water use than normal. Hey, what about systems without disinfectant residual? Well, typically well water is colder and pipes are bigger, and there are less and different microbial growth, so biofilm does not influence it as much. Now, I'm going to show you how flushing works and what happens if someone tries flushing but it is incomplete. In this image, the blue outline pipes carry cold water and red outline pipes carry hot water. Now, let's say all pipes are stagnated. You can see brown water inside all the pipes. We're going to flush this building. To do that, we open a cold water faucet on the first floor. The fresh water comes in passes through a water softener, and goes to a sink on the first floor. Next, let's go to second floor and open up another faucet for cold water. Now let's open up the same faucet for hot water. You can see fresh cold water now enters the water heater tank, and hot water reaches this faucet. If you look at it, these pipes I opened up have been flushed. But what about other locations? There is a dead end pipe for cold water in the first floor, and it is still colored brown. That's old water. Also, we went to second floor without completely removing old water from the first floor hot water. That is incomplete flushing. We left old water inside the building water system. Here, you need to think about the stepwise process by which you flush location by location and remove water from the building methodically. Another challenge is that plumbing is not so simple. Even with just a simple animation you just saw, you learn that we need to really understand how the building water system is set up. A detailed plumbing diagram can be extremely helpful to create a flushing plan. You also need to know which mechanical and plumbing equipment exist in the building and where. These include devices such as softeners, heater tanks, and specific devices like ice machines, and point-of-use devices in the building like faucet or under-sink filters. Why do we need all that information? Well, because some buildings have very complicated plumbing designs. In one building we found, there were numerous pipes of different diameters even along with the same water line. To flush completely, it is important to know how much volume you need to flush and how long flushing will take. Sometimes the water travels a long ways after passing through the water meter before entering the building. One building had water flow around the loop before the fresh water actually entered the building. So, understanding how the water gets to the building after passing through the meter is really important. Flow rate is depending on the pipe length and sizes, but also if you wanted to flush multiple sinks in a room at the same time, you may need to flush for a longer time because flow rate changes. Lastly, some for this location in large buildings may be harder to ensure complete flushing because it takes longer time to bring water to the furthest location. Another challenge with flushing concerns worker. Different level of personal protective equipment is needed depending on what is in or what could be in the water. Scalding is a real concern for hot water. Some buildings have very hot water and sometimes hot water recirculation systems, so do not flush hot water. Typically, these systems are shut off and then cooled. After cooling, these systems should be flushed with cold water. 
If the cold or hot water contains high concentrations of chemical and microbiological contaminants, persons who conduct flush should wear safety gears such as gloves, goggles, and consider a mask. For the mask, N95 masks were approved by NIOSH, but when harmful organisms like Legionella are suspected to be present, OSHA requires wearing N100 respirators with cartridges. There are some other complications that need to be considered. It is important to know all the water systems in the building because everything affects water movement. So you need to make sure to flush dead ends and include non-potable water systems like toilets and fire hydrants and more. If there is low flow devices like water bubblers coming really slow, you may need to flush for a longer time or even switch the point of use device as well. In this video, I explain the purpose of flushing building water systems. By flushing, we can remove materials that have accumulated in water during stagnation. This can include bacteria, sediments, lead, and copper. We also want to replace the old water with fresh water in the pipes. I mentioned that one-time flush can be helpful, but a single flush may not remove everything, so repeated flushing was recommended. Making sure the water used for flushing is fresh is important, and you can do that by testing. And finally, I identified some challenges with flushing building water systems. These included plumbing complexity, worker safety, and other considerations that should be considered. I hope you enjoyed watching this short video, and if you're looking for more information, please visit our website at plumbingsafety.org, or you can contact us directly. If you're also looking to learn how to design a flushing plan, please tune into our other videos. Thank you for listening and have a great day.